Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling bright and blessed in Jesus this morning. I trust that you enjoy these lessons together as much as I do in doing them. And I pray that your eyes are being enlightened to the truth of God so that as you arise each morning, you know what your mission in your journey is. And that is simply to live in obedience and absolute surrender unto the Lord Jesus whom you serve. Now we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we are going to continue in chapter 19, picking up the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now when we were last together, we discussed what the actual sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was, and how those sins, as simple as they were, sins of the heart, led to the most defiant acts of sins, that of sexual perversion, because it is this sin in which we use our bodies. And of course, God created us. And so to turn from what was naturally intended for us is the greatest act of sin. We know this from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse, beginning in verse 18, where we are told to flee fornication or sexual acts of sin. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and you do not belong to yourselves? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Don't use your body for sexual sins and in such a form of rebellion, but in your spirit, glorify God in your body, which is God's. And so we're going to see in our story this morning that the men of Sodom were steeped in sexual acts of sin, specifically homosexuality, even to the point of wanting to commit these abominable acts with the angels of God. And so we pick up in verse one, it says, there came two angels to Sodom at even, which is in the evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot seeing them rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night. Wash your feet, and when you rise in the morning, you can go on your way. And they said, No, but we will abide in the street all night. But he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him. And so he made them a feast, and they did eat. Now before the angels laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around both old men and young men, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men who came into you this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now when it says know them, that is in the same way that the Bible tells us that Abraham knew his wife. Adam knew Eve. And from knowing each other, they produced offspring. And so when the Bible says that they wanted to know them, it's implicating the sexual acts that they wanted to commit with them. And so Lot went unto the door, and he said, Brethren, do not so wickedly. I have two daughters, and they are virgins. They have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them whatever you will. Only these men who have come unto me do nothing. Now the men of the city apparently see these angels just as normal men. But Lot, we know, because he bowed down before them, sees them, and knows them to be representatives of the kingdom of heaven. And so he is protecting them even to the point of offering his own daughters to these vile and wicked men to do unto them whatsoever they wish. And so we see that Lot is placing God before even what he loves most. And Jesus speaks of this when he says in Luke chapter 14, he who does not hate his mother, hate his father, hate his children, hate his wife, hate his very own life, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, God is to be first in our lives regardless of what it cost us in this life. And even in offering these virgin girls to these wicked men, they say in verse 9, stand back. You are simply a visitor in our city. Who are you to judge us? You're not one of us. 
Now we will deal worse with you than we would with the men. And so they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men, or the angels, they put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house, smote the men that were at the door with blindness, and began to tell Lot to gather all of his family because Sodom and Gomorrah was about to be destroyed. And so in verse 14, Lot speaks to his family, his sons-in-laws and his daughters, and he says, get out of this place for the Lord's going to destroy it. But they thought that he was joking. They thought he was jesting. Well, they spent the night in the house, and when the morning arose in verse 15, the angels hastened Lot. They hurried Lot and said, Arise, take your wife, your daughters, which are here. Get out of the city unless you be consumed because of the iniquity of this city. And while Lot lingered or took his time, the men grabbed him by the hand, grabbed his wife and daughters, and hurried them out of the city. And they said unto Lot, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not stay in this place. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Not so, my Lord. You have shown me mercy by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountain. Some evil might betake me there, and I might die. Behold, a city is near that I can flee unto. It's only a little city. Let me go there and my soul shall live. Now notice the mistake that Lot originally made was going to the city. And he's been so accustomed to the way of the city that he doesn't want to go back into the barrenness of the plain, the solitude and the loneliness that the plain would offer, but he wants to go into the busyness of the city. And he knows that this is the wrong decision because of the way that he makes the question. He says, the city I want to flee into, it's a little city. It's not a big city. There's not a lot of sin there. It's not like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's only a little city. And so you can hear the compromise in his voice. And so the angels focused upon their mission simply tell Lot to go. They give their approval. And in verse 24, we're told that the Lord himself, the Almighty, rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And God overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities. But Lot's wife looked back from behind him. She became a pillar of salt. Now, we kind of have to read between the lines here, which means that this is absolute speculation. But it would seem that the implication here is that Lot's wife looked back missing what Sodom had to offer. That she desired to be in the city and she regretted that Sodom and Gomorrah was being destroyed. And for this, the curse of God came upon her and she became a pillar of salt. Again, entirely speculative, but it does make a lot of sense, especially when we look at our own journeys and the Lord tells us to flee the wrath to come which is the world behind us, and to pursue righteousness, which is his kingdom. And so we are not to look back upon the things behind us with desire, a desire to return unto those things. Well, after Lot's wife becomes a pillar of salt, we're told in verse 30 that Lot went out of that tiny city called Zor, and he dwelt in the mountain, which was the one place he didn't want to go. But something finally triggered within him, and he understood the danger that lies within the city. And he took his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. Why? Because he knew how his soul had been vexed, how he was tormented day and night in the city, being racked with guilt and shame, knowing that he's living outside of the obedience of God. And so his fear drove him into the caves of the mountains. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 6 says, Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, God condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should live thereafter ungodly. But he delivered just Lot, who was vexed with the filthy manner of living of the wicked. His soul was weighed down and tormented each day. And so he finds the solitude that his soul is craving in the empty places of the mountains, specifically these caves that he dwelt in. And friends, I can assure you how much happier you and I would be if our dwelling place was in the solitude of those mountains as opposed to these unrighteous, ungodly cities 
that we live within. Well, now the chapter ends by telling us that the, the daughters of Lot had given up any hope of producing children. And so in verse 31, the firstborn said unto the younger, our father is old and there's not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. There are no men around us. So if our father dies, if we're going to carry on his seed, we must get our father drunk, lie with him, and then we can produce offspring. And so in verse 33, they made the father drink wine that night. The firstborn went in, lay with her father. He didn't know that she had laid with him, and she arose. The next morning, the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with our father. Let us make him drink wine again tonight, and you go in this time, and you lie with him, so that you may bear offspring as well. And so in verse 35, they made their father drink wine that night also. The younger arose and lay with her father. Now he knew not what she had done unto him, and both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. Now the firstborn bare a son. She called his name Moab, and he became the father of the Moabites. The younger also bare a son, called his name Ben-Ami, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. And that brings us to the end of chapter 19. Now, I think what we take away from this chapter more than anything else, and there are many lessons within this chapter, but I think what's more relevant to us in our day-by-day -day journey unto the Lord Jesus is the fact that many of us do not have the liberty to leave all behind, go to a cave, and make it our dwelling place until the day that we die. And although it would be difficult for us to do that, we would grow in both our knowledge and our relationship of the Lord even greater than we do now simply because many of the distractions that the city holds for us, we would be absent of in those places of solitude. But as I stated, many of us don't have that liberty to do such things. And yet we do not need to feel that the Christian life is one of defeat because we are under such vexation, that we live in the midst of such evil. For where sin abounds, friends, grace even more abounds. And so I want to encourage you that even in the midst of evil, you can live a victorious life in Jesus Christ. Just because you have a television, just because you're linked up with DirecTV, doesn't mean that you have to watch everything that is aired on that television. You can exercise self-control and change the channel or turn it off. The same with the choices that you have in the music that you listen to. You don't have to be a participant in listening to the things that the world listens to. And this is true with every one of the choices that we have before us, friends. Whether it be wearing jewelry, the type of clothing that we wear, how we spend our money, how we use our time. We can make choices that keep God first in all areas of our lives even in the midst of the pervasive evil that surrounds us. And so I want to encourage you, friends, not to be sucked into the world that you live in, not to place your affections or passions upon the things that this world offers, but as Colossians chapter 3 tells us, if you are risen with Christ, if you have been born again, if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus, seek the things which are of above, which come from the kingdom of heaven, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections on those things, things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead unto this world that you live in, and your life has been hid with Christ in God. Now the Bible wouldn't give us this command if it were not possible to live as such. And to be honest with you, if you were in that place of solitude where none of the offerings of this world were offered unto you, there wouldn't be a sense of victory or accomplishment in your daily life knowing that you have rejected such things as a sacrifice unto the name of the Lord because being absent of those things, obviously there would be no sacrifice. And so as all the things of this world are being offered to you and you continually reject them and say no, what a sense of victory in your soul. What a sense of accomplishment and faithfulness before the Lord. Knowing you are keeping the Lord first in all things as you reject and deny these things that you know your Lord, your King, your Master, and your Savior 
find such disapproval with. Well, we're going to close there today, friends, and I'm so grateful again that you are with us, that you are sitting and learning of the things of God and that they are truly having a deep impact within your life. Well, now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. May your journey be blessed today, and I'll see you on the next video.